Hi, I'm Laura McInerney. I am talking today about the seven most needed answers in education. In maths, for a long time, there have been prizes for people who can find out the things that are most needed in that area, and I think in education it would be great if we could do the same thing. As some of you could probably see, it looked like there were technical problems. Actually, like all good teachers, I had it not just in Dropbox and also in my email, but also on a memory stick. Now, I'm slightly concerned that it might be an older version. So if I look kind of surprised at one point, just write it out with me. Just go with it. So um, the talk today is called How the Millennium Prize Problems Could Save Us All. And I said in the program that, there were a couple of, uh, that, that I wanted people to come ready to think because there's going to be some questions today which I can't give any answers to, but which I want us to start thinking about. And maybe through research, Ed, this can be some kind of catalyst to start putting some questions and answers together. Um, the reason I start with this question, what problem in education would you pay a million pounds to solve, is because of the Millennium Prize. So Millennium Prize was seven questions that were written by mathematicians at the turn of the century to try and focus people in maths on the seven most important things that people needed to know. And I remember when reading this thinking, well, if I had a million pounds and I was going to set up a competition, what, you know, what would I actually ask people to do? And so the question I want you to keep thinking about throughout the session is, well, what problems actually do we think if someone solved this, we would be like, that is definitely worth a million pounds? However, I embarrassingly, after writing several months ago my, uh, my little thing about how the Millennium Prize problems could save us all, found out that the Millennium Prize problems are actually based on something much older. So it was August 1900, it was the 8th of August 1900. I was really hoping it was going to be the 7th of September, but unfortunately... <laughs> On the 8th of August 1900, this man, David Hilbert, who was a prize mathematician at the time, stood up on a stage at the Paris Convention and he read out, well, in fact, in his lecture he didn't read them out, but he suggested that there were 23 problems in maths that, if answered, they would push forward maths and our understanding of it. And at the time, I remember thinking to myself, that's quite a useful way of doing this. And I understand that education isn't maths, but there are some similarities. At that time, actually maths was quite disparate. People weren't necessarily as focused as they ought to be. And one of the things that people, people kept talking about, and I found this very interesting, was in maths, for example, you can uh, do operations in different dimensions, so five dimension shape, 23 dimensions, and so on. And what people were saying is operations don't always work in every dimension. What happens in the fifth dimension is not the same in the 23rd. But there were general principles that could be pushed together. And that's what Hilbert was trying to do, was pull people back towards what was important and what was going to push things forwards. Now, they became known as Hilbert's problems and they went for about 100 years. Some of them have been answered, some of them have been found to be impossible and actually proven to be impossible, which I think is quite important as well. And so I thought, well, what could we have in education? And then, unfortunately, my name is McInerney, which no one can spell and no one can say. So I thought McInerney's problems is not going to be very helpful. I can see a number of people just go, that's how you say it, OK. <laughs> I saw it up there and it's embarrassing. Yeah, so Hilbert's problems, great. McInerney's problems, not so much. So I came up with this idea of what are education's touch paper problems? And the touch paper is what you like to set off a firework or to set off some kind of something else that's going to uh, explode and, and kind of have an effect. So instead of Hilbert's problems, what are our touch paper problems? And again, that's what I'm going to try and get us to think about throughout this. What are the problems we need to solve? If we were going to solve a million pounds or give a million pounds, which ones would we look at? Now, some of you may not know who I am. Um, I was a teacher in East London for six years. Um, several people do tend to know me from either Twitter or I write for The Guardian and uh, occasionally for the TS as well. But really, I was a teacher for six years. That's been the thing that I enjoyed and loved and missed the classroom very much. These were my students. Last year in September, I moved to... Oh, this is the old one. See, this is the bit where we ride it out. I moved to Missouri. Um, I'm doing a PhD in education and I moved over there to 
uh, try and learn a little bit more. People keep asking me what Missouri is like, so very quickly, there's some cockroach racing, some milking of cows, some rodeo. That's pretty much what happens in Missouri when I'm not at the university. But in terms of the touch paper problems, <laughs> to go back to that, what I thought when I, when I sat down to write this was, what are the differences between when I was in the classroom and when I was in Missouri? What are the different priorities I have in research and what can that tell us about how these problems should be created? Now, in my classroom, what I needed to know were generally how to solve issues around learning. So I would have a student who couldn't grasp something, I had a whole group who were struggling with something, and I wanted to know what I could do to help those students learn. There was also some issues around social development. I might have a student who was very, very shy and wasn't speaking, or a student who um, was really struggling with being bullied, and we could see that there was some help that they needed. Now, in each of these particular problems, what I was looking for and what I was hoping for was that there could be some principles or some rules about well, what do we try in these circumstances to start with. Not necessarily that we're going to have the answer, but surely research can give me what can I try first? What's got the best probability? What might, what might work 50% of the time and then 20% of the time and then two, one, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And I, I really struggled. And the few that I've used over the years, for example, um, Maslow's hierarchy, I always thought was a great one because I could look through and I could see, well, how are people feeling? Now, uh, luckily for me, given that it's currently lunchtime, it's about 100 degrees in here, Maslow's hierarchy was apparently debunked by the BBC this week. So uh, you must all be feeling absolutely fine right now with this heat. It's not distracting you at all. But I think those kinds of principles, whether they get debunked and we replace them, or whether you know, they continue for some time, I think they're quite important. And one of the reasons I think they're important, and I know this is in contrast to lots of other speakers um, who've spoken this morning, I was in here for Frank's talk earlier today, is that I'm not as comfortable as other people are with the idea that I can go, well, I just felt like it was a good idea. And it's not that I don't think that we can't trust our intuitions or that we can't work out from meeting a child how, how they operate, but I do think that as professionals, we should be justifying ourselves. So I used to keep my classroom door open and people could come in and they would frequently tell me everything that was wrong with my lessons. And that's absolutely fine. But I thought that my professional duty then was to try and justify why I did things. That I would try and say, well, you know, in general, the principle is this. I take on board that. Maybe if you've got a different principle, I can take it on board. But if we can't have those conversations, if we're not coming from some base of something, then I think actually as professionals, we can be letting ourselves down and we actually aren't having good enough conversations. If I walk in someone's classroom and I say, I, I disagree with this particular type of practice and they go, well, I disagree because I just feel like I disagree, our conversation has stopped. And I'm not sure that that is as productive as a conversation in which even if we're holding different principles and we're trying to work out which one is correct, I still think we can be more productive. So this was what I was looking for when I was busy in my classroom trying to get people learning and socially developing. It's been quite difficult this year in a situation in the university where you have quite different priorities. And this is one of the things that I'm quite interested in of the randomised control trials and, and obviously one of the big things that we're talking about today is whether there can be more of this experimental stuff. Actually, if you're in a university, and I've pick that picture in contrast to my horrible classroom that flashed up earlier, in, as I would call it, the kind of ivory tower, it's different to what you can do in a school. So timings, for example, teachers' timetables cannot be changed. And it's very difficult as a researcher to try and work around people's timetables because you may only have a short period of time that you can meet people for. You turn up, they've already stayed with the child for 10 minutes, you've now got 30 minutes, they've got to run off again and photocopy something before their next lesson. The difficulty of timing does make operating with schools quite difficult, as does the locations of schools. What tends to happen with us, I'm in quite a rural area, is that we'll just pick the same schools because they're nearby all the time and we can get to them. Schools that are further out tend to be missed out. We also have the issue in the university of every time we're making a decision, we are focused on can we make our methods 
do or can we can we use a method that will be justifiable in terms of the things we have to publish can we come up with the data that we need that's rigorous in the way we need it the person who doesn't figure in that conversation <laughs> is the classroom teacher because really that's not it's not the same set of priorities and so i guess i've had a much more frustrating time trying to come up with things in learning. And that's why randomised control trials are great in the sense of I think they get around some of these problems, but whether they give us the actual principles, the actual justifications of why something is working so that teachers can fully understand it and in the moment use those principles to justify their practice, I am quite concerned that we're not going to, if we just use randomised control trials, that we're not going to get to that point. So, I sat down thinking about this gap and I thought, well, how do we br bridge this gap of needs? On the one hand, researchers need to be doing their thing. On the other hand, we need some kinds of principles and rules. At the minute, it's not really anybody's priority to try and, to try and overlap in this particular way. And that was when I happened to come across Hilbert and Hilbert's problems. And I thought, well, this is, this is a way of unifying what people are um, looking for if you like. So that what we could do is collectively, whether it's 23 problems or my preference for seven, we could come up with what teachers actually need. But what Hilbert was quite clever about was that he didn't just come up with questions. And that's, I've kind of toed and froed on this. He came up with problems. So if I give you an example, one of the problems he mentions in his speech, which had already been solved, but it's, it's the, sim I don't know maths that well, so it's the simplest one to explain. He said if you have uh, a wire with a bead at the top and the bead is going to be let go and it's going to travel to the bottom, what shape does the wire need to be to move most quickly from top to bottom? That in and of itself is a problem. It's not just a question, there's a specific problem that you're trying to come up with. And then people went away and figured it out and there's some kind of curve. So, <laughs> <laughs> as I say, maths, not my favourite. Um, same with the Millennium Prize problems, but what they did was they upped the ante this time. So they just said seven. Forget 23. People can only hold seven things in their mind at once. Let's just go with seven. That's why I wrote seven in the thing. I was like, well, we'll figure out seven. Um, a million pounds that they put up for anyone who could answer them. That was in 2000. One had been answered up until July 2013. So I think they're probably regretting some of them now because they've made them quite difficult. But what's even more fascinating about the seven questions in maths, and this is where I think I understand that education isn't maths. You can't just solve and prove things once and for all. And actually, even in maths, you can't do that once you get into it. It's this thing that they wrote about. So the Millennium Prize problem. The prizes were conceived to record some of the most difficult problems with which mathematicians were grappling at the turn of the second millennium to elevate in the consciousness of the general public the fact that in mathematics the frontier is still open and abounds in important unsolved problems and to emphasize the importance of working towards a solution of the deepest most difficult problems and in many ways i think the millennium prize has been about showing people that this stuff is really hard 13 years on and we're still working away at it but that's good, that's not a problem. The fact that we haven't got this solved is okay because it's difficult, it's still open, that's what makes, in my view, education exciting. We've still got to improve on this and it's important that we work towards solutions. So it's not acceptable in maths constantly to go, well, I quite like my 23rd dimension, so I'm just gonna stick over here on my 23rd dimension and work that out. Actually, there's a responsibility to people who look at all of the different dimensions and that we've got to try and get some general principles and bring them together. So I was pretty motivated by the Millennium Prize problems. However, if I was you, sat there right now, probably tweeting this and being mean, then <laughs> anyone who knows me is laughing, then I would be thinking, well... Maths is not the same, okay? 
they can have one answer, it's rational, once it's answered, it's answered forever. My school is on top of a hill, yours is at the bottom of a valley, the air pressure is different, you know, it's never, it's never going to work. So I thought, okay, well, has anyone else done this? Can't only be Matt, it can't be David Hilbert, and then 100 years later, seven mathematicians who decided this. Someone else must have done something similar, and maybe they did it in a field more similar to education. And um, so I looked at these. What edge of practice questions do we have? How are they similar to what other people have done? And if you look around, actually, there are other examples. This is a science one. I'm still in the science and math zone. I get that, but we'll get there. Um, does anyone know what this represents? I'm trying to guess if any of the scientists would know. It's 1959. Someone stood on a stage and they said, no one knows, great. So, Richard, I never know how to say his name. Is it Richard Feynman? Feynman? Feynman, there we go. See, you did know it, really. You're all keeping quiet. Richard Feynman stood on a stage in 1959 and he said, the first person who can put the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pin, well, uh, all the scientists are going, oh, I knew that. Um, the first person who can put the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pin will win, it was quite a, a big prize. I think it got much smaller by 1986 when it actually finally got solved. It took a very long time. But this was an example of a problem. It took years to solve, but it was a specific thing. So I thought, okay, well, that's still quite difficult. It's quite specific. It's just, we'll get there. I'm gonna skip ahead one to this one. Anyone care to take a guess at what this one is? I'm hearing frog. <laughs> it's a frog. It's a toad. It's a cane toad. Well done. I wish I had a sticker or something to give you. That's the teacher in me uh, missing out. It's an Australian giant cane toad. Uh, they were introduced to Australia. It was one of those sort of women that swallowed the fly and the spider and so on. Australia had some problems, then they introduced something else, then they introduced the cane toads. They became massive. And so they, again, they had this issue. <laughs> literally huge and they decided to put out a challenge that had a lot of money attached to it saying can anyone come up with a trap for the giant cane toad eventually after several years someone comes up with a trap for the cane toad the problem there with this one is that i worry we slightly get into this territory of coming up with inventions rather than principles and again, as a teacher, that wasn't necessarily what I needed because I might have a student and someone would go, well, there's this great computer program and, you know, it will solve all your problems. But if I don't have the computer pro program, I don't know the underlying principle. So what we actually need to do is have the underlying principle of how a cane toad works, then know how the invention works. And it's the principle of how the invention actually works is the thing that we need to be looking for, in my view. So in randomised control trials, I think that it should be the underlying principles of whatever intervention it is that we're trying that we actually raise up and highlight. Not this thing will work if you give these children these books. I want to know what it is about those particular books so that even if I didn't buy them, I could replicate something similar. So that got me thinking. And the one I'm going to go back to is this. Now, I hadn't come across it. I'm slightly, I'm slightly wearing of the Ted brand, but... TED Med is, uh, it's only come out in about the last 18 months. And what it is, is the, um, the TED brand has worked with lots of people very high up in medicine across the world to come up with 20 great challenges. Um, and what they've done is they've said, these are the most important things in medicine. They're not trying to solve them, which I noticed in this one. What they're doing is they're having sort of big conversations across the world about them. They're getting people online to speak, to, um, to debate publicly, to write things. But it's interesting that medicine, and they say up front, this is not something that can be resolved. You know, and it's funny because in education, we're sort of constantly running after medicine as if it's this great, perfect science. Whereas in fact, what medicine has said is, we're not even going to try and solve this because that's not how it really works. So TEDMED have got these 20 great challenges, including, um, I know two are on dementia, and cancer is not in there, which seems to have been... Uh, quite a surprise to a lot of people, but their argument is that there's a lot more known about that already and actually it's not the edge of practice. So I think this taught us something about 
how we actually come up with these questions. So, having looked at all three, I started thinking, well, what should education touch paper problems look like? And I think that's quite tricky. The three things I could work out at this point are, and this is where I really don't know if I've got the old ones, or I've got the new ones-ish. Um, <laughs> I think they need to be specifically focused on cognitive and or social development. And that is not the same as all of education research. It's very easy, I think, sitting in a school to go, all of this education research, a lot of it isn't relevant to us. Actually, a lot of it isn't supposed to be relevant, but I think the stuff that does need to be razor-like focused is the stuff that's on this. And it's not always happening in education departments. Some of it happens in psychology departments. Some of it happens in different places. A lot of the uh, subject departments will have their own things as well. It needs to be about the principles and not the inventions. So actually, the focus needs to be what questions would help us get to a principle rather than just inventing something. And I think there needs to be some kind of defined endpoint. That's the bit that's controversial. TEDMED, I sort of think, could have everyone working really hard for two years, but we don't know if we've found anything or not. So these problems have to be something that we know when we've solved it, we've solved it. So at this point, this is where I'd said about thinking for a few minutes, it's also very warm. I must be quite red by now. So what I'm going to get people to do, just for a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to reveal kind of two of the problems that I'd come up with, is give you a minute to digest that, have a think, see if you could maybe come up with a problem, think of the beads, a problem yourselves. And then um, in two minutes time, I'm going to, well, that will give us three minutes, I'm going to reveal a couple of mine and then maybe take some ideas from people as well. So three minutes for me to kind of breathe and you to think. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to present to you my two problems. And thank you. So uh, a lot of people have gone, this is quite hard. It is. I was quite uh, pleased when uh, this week I, I properly read the Hilbert book. And it turns out, actually, it took him over a year to write this list of problems. And he didn't read them all out of his lecture. I had been feeling the pressure that I needed to turn up with these seven questions. And it turned out, if even David Hilbert didn't do it, then I was definitely not going to turn up with this list of seven questions. However, I did come up with a couple of problems. And that's what's quite tough about this. How do you make it a problem rather than just a question? Uh, quite a few people said, how do you make it definable? So there's a definable end point. So, Here's an example. I already know there's a, some concern with this, but I'm going to go with it anyway. So this was the example I came up with. What is the short, shortest period of time in which a person with dyslexia can be taught to spell the thousand most common words in English? So we have a problem. That is, people who have statements of dyslexia struggle sometimes to spell. However, we're not saying we're going to solve the whole problem of spelling, but if you could spell the thousand most common words, that would probably be quite a helpful thing. It would be ideal if we could get it done quickly, not least because those of us, especially in secondary schools, who teach students who are still struggling with this, would probably appreciate the speed. We're not saying it's going to solve everything, but it's got a definable point. It is difficult to believe it would be a useful thing, you know, it, sorry, it's easy to believe this would be a useful thing to do. So then, we would have to start thinking about principles. We would have to start thinking about, well, what do you have to do to get someone to learn this? What speeds it up? And by having different ideas about that, we could then test different things. Now, this is where randomised control trials might help people test out different ways of doing this. But we could also effectively just test it by trying one thing and trying another thing and seeing what the shortest period of time is. Now there's some other problems because different people will do it differently so you might have to take some kind of averages across a big group but effectively it's a problem from which we can move forwards and that's exactly what Hilbert did and the Millennium Prize problems if you go on Wikipedia and look them up they will be in one line I don't understand them something about P and not P or 
some kind of, I got, that was as close as I got. I was going to put one in. I thought, I, just, I don't know what P stands for here right now. And I wanted to know, and that's good, because you can click on a little link and it will show you the whole problem. So actually, you can have some other rules that sit underneath these. But effectively, this would be a problem that I think most people could get behind. Some people would complain. Some people always do. We could get behind it. A second one um, was this. If a child needs to remember, and I stuck it in there, 20 chunks of knowledge. Now we could argue about what chunks of knowledge is. Fine, we can define it. But if a child needs to remember 20 chunks of knowledge from one lesson to the next, what is the most effective homework to set? Now, that has some more principles in it again. For example, what homeworks are children likely to do? Because it might be that it's the most effective thing to get a person doing remembering 20 chunks of knowledge, but it also might be not the kind of things that people do. So it's a problem. And they're the kinds of problems that we as teachers face all the time. I have to have you remember this stuff. I need you to know it by next lesson. I need to set you a task for homework. I would like to know what is the most effective way. Now, I'm also aware that it won't always be the most effective in the same way that the 23rd, degree, the 23rd dimension is different from the fifth. But what we're talking about is where do I start? 50% of the time, 70% of the time, I can start from this and then I can move on in terms of what I do next and I can justify it and I can come back to the principles of why we think this works because we've actually, when we've solved it, gone through the principles. They're not just inventions. So, my conclusion on this particular talk is that this is an important question. Hashtags for Twitter. What are education's touch paper problems? Not Mac and any problems. <laughs> what are education's touch paper problems? And um, how can we actually push this forward? And I think one of the things maybe that what we need to think out about after today's event is whether there is some kind of actions or some kind of manifesto for things going forwards in terms of how this research can actually be used. And this is something that I would like to try and put some problems together that we can all focus on together. They're not going to solve everything, but they might, like in 1900, start to get us to the edge of practice, justifying and agreeing on things. We have about six to seven minutes for questions, comments, any problems that you would like to suggest. That's absolutely great. And, um, but other than that, I'm just going to listen to you and answer any questions. So, concerns, questions, problems that you think should be the most important ones? I think it's really interesting. I, I, we, we, we were talking about different, uh, you know, like everyone was, and we weren't sure kind of what the scope, the scope should be. So, some of ours were things like, can you separate, ever separate the way students perform from what they've learnt? Or, on the other hand, we were saying, you know, does it matter what type of school you're in as to how you learn, that sort of thing. So, the institutional sort of system issues versus very fundamental questions about the brain. You know, how, how would one of these problems be formed? Would it have to be quite sure. focused or could it be very sort of broad? I don't think there's any reason why they, they could be broad. I think that end point is quite important and that makes it much more difficult to come up with these problems and that makes them a specific type of problem which I think can add something but they don't solve those kind of philosophical some of them are more philosophical problems. On the institutional stuff, I guess I go back to this, which is that I am in my school. It is the type of school it is. <laughs> it is a boys' school, a girls' school, a secondary school. It's in inner city, up a hill, down a valley, like I said before. I can't change that. So I suppose I would, I, my feeling would be that in these particular very focused questions, I would want to err away from anything that an individual teacher couldn't use when making a learning decision. Um, which doesn't mean they're not important questions, just for me, not these particular touch paper ones for driving forward practice. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm hiding behind the camera, if that's all. Um, um, yeah, I I'm following on from that point, actually, because your first assumption that it should be focused on cognitive development and social development makes an awful lot of sense, but education is much broader than that. And to get to that point where the teacher is actually making those sorts of 
uh, having that sort of level of thought about what's going on, they need to they need to have a professional understanding of who they are as a teacher. Do you see what I mean? So I would suggest that your your touch paper question should be mo focused more on the professionalism of the teacher, teacher training, teacher development, sort of stuff that David over there is, has been doing uh, with the Teacher Development Trust. Um, I think that's got to be your first starting point, uh, because otherwise you're going to have teachers who are acting in a very functional way and then won't have the understanding of those cognitive development issues that you need to be able to understand in order to make those sorts of judgments that you're talking about. I mean, I think, I think you're absolutely right that all, what happens in the training is absolutely crucial and who you are as a teacher absolutely matters. I suppose these are about this edge of, pra this edge of practice in terms of what you're doing in the classroom and really understanding it and justifying it further. And so I guess, I'm, to me, this would almost be the next step. But, but these problems written in this way, I'm not sure necessarily go over to teacher training. Now, it could be that people who are involved in teacher training go, actually, we would like our own seven questions. And Weston's problems is a much nicer, <laughs> a much ni nicer uh, thing than, than my awful surname. So like, I think that could work, but I wouldn't want to get away from. I think it's so easy and so much research is done in that field already. And so much research is done in the institutional realm that for me, I still want to advocate for this quite strongly and quite separately. Yep. Um, I completely understand your desire to get uh, answers to questions which people can implement individually in their own things. I worry, I think, that we're then looking at pushing the edge of where we are now, not looking about whether we're in completely the wrong place. If we were designing schools and school terms and the school setup in general, now with the technology with the modern day with the not having a harvest season and all of those other things would we set it up the way we do now would we teach people in year groups would we teach people in three terms with a break so i'm personally as well as these that you mm -hmm. can use individually would also really like a question on if we were starting with a blank, sh blank sheet of paper how would we design education systems it doesn't meet the third principle of a defined end point, I guess, because you're not going to get agreement on it. And I know that these aren't necessarily going to be agreed upon, but you can, I think they're more easily movable. And again, it's a bit like the teacher training and institutional stuff. It's not that it's not important. This is just a slightly separate way. And I agree, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. You could put an end point on it. Okay. You have more than three minutes to think about it. <laughs> Well, I look forward to more, more thinking. That's what I asked people to do. <laughs> but yeah, more thinking on it, definitely, then. Um, thanks very much for the session. Just to respond to the last two comments, actually. Um, then it's not mutually exclusive, but in some ways, I suppose, what you're proposing by focusing on cognitive and social development is actually a very pragmatic approach, um, because it's only out of that that you can then have the systemic change, I think. So this sort of focus on bottom-up would then force people to collaborate along the way in order to try and achieve it and then to share the practice and some of the things that Ben was saying at the start. Even the guy that designed the toe traps probably set up a company and then a whole load of other people benefited and there are all these spin-offs that could come off from this sort of thing that are unpredictable, which is quite exciting. Um, so I think by focusing on the nitty gritty detail is actually the, way, the only way you can really put up and focus on the principles, the only way you can put up something systemic anyway. I agree, yeah. Um, Western seven problems are actually quite dull. <laughs> My, uh, when I was in the classroom, I think the seven things that probably bugged me most. If I'd actually been a researcher and been able to find things out, I think the answers were already there for most of them. So I actually wonder, rather than coming up with seven new problems, some, would, would there be a benefit in saying, what are the seven most common problems that teachers have in the classroom? And what are the key principles we can get give for them rather than coming up with new ones? This is what Perfect. I almost feel like I've cued you. Um, so, so, so this is the last thing I'm going to say, so we're, we're just getting on to time. But no, I absolutely agree with you. One of the interesting things with the Millennium Prize problem is the one that was solved was solved very quickly. There was already quite a few solutions out there. It was the same with Hilbert's problems. Actually, I think that's the power of this, is that if you got people talking and we found the seven most common, some of them might already be out there. The control trials, the qualitative stuff, the sense on this might already exist, and we just pull it together, knock that problem out, and put another one in. And, but you've got to have that bit where you actually say this is important enough 
to bring all those people together. Otherwise, the priorities are not quite aligned. And so I think, yeah, I absolutely agree. I think it blends in fine with, with this, if that's okay. Anyway, that's time, everyone. I know you've all got places to get to the next one. <laughs>